if you would please take out your uh, chapter 10 section 3 on the back side of section 4 notes and you see that I have a section over here on the uh, right hand side for your video lecture notes and if you need more space you can come over to the back side on chapter 10 section 4 and use that space but the right hand side will be where you'd want to keep the notes for for this uh, presentation um, we're gonna get right into it right now just Peter Klein right outside the window making sure I'm recording um, I am starting with this map right here because this is what the United States looked like in 1850 and if you look at what we have here we have the results of the compromise of 1850 now obviously the southern slave states are in red the northern free states are in blue any territory that is already determined that it will have um, no slavery is also in blue so like this big unorganized territory here this Minnesota territory the Oregon territory all of that is going to be free from slavery and then we have this tan which on here it says territories open to slavery in 1850 but really what that means is it's open to popular sovereignty. And so let's just make sure that you understand what that means. Popular sovereignty, you may want to define this in your notes. Popular sovereignty was an idea put forward by a Northern Democrat named Lewis Cass, C-A-S-S. -S. And he said, if we just open the territory and let whoever wants move there, in the end, it will either be a majority slave or a majority free. And whatever it's a majority is what it will become. And the idea was you take the, the, um, the controversy over slavery out of Congress and you put it on, in the hands of the people who are settling in the territory. And when it's you know, out here, everything works out fine. But here's what happens. And we met this guy a while ago, this little guy here, Stephen A. Douglas from Illinois. He's the guy that came in and picked up the Compromise of 1850 and worked it through Congress. Uh, a few years later, he's going to come back with a new idea. And his new idea is called the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And this probably should be in your timeline for uh, Chapter 10, Section 3, the notes on the left. Um, in 1854, he presents a, a bill to Congress called the Kansas-Nebraska Act in which he says, this territory, right, Kansas and Nebraska, the old Louisiana Purchase Territory, which you should note is north of 3630, he says, in 1850, it's unorganized. Now, he suggests that they organize it into these two territories, Kansas and Nebraska, and that they open it to popular sovereignty, since that seems to be working out here in New Mexico and Utah. Now, the reason that it's working out in New Mexico and Utah is that nobody's going there, and there's no controversy. Kansas, as you can see, it borders Missouri, it borders Iowa. You know, this is some place that people might actually move to. And that's what Douglas wanted. You see, his ultimate goal was to get a transcontinental railroad built. And he thought the only way that this is going to work is if there are stations and stops in here. And in order for that to happen, we need people in here. And so he needed to encourage people to settle this old, unorganized territory. And, and I'll be putting, if it's not already underneath or above me or wherever I put it, um, highlighting kind of what I'm talking about here. But that's probably what you should have in your notes in the little boxes that I'll add. Well, what ends up happening is exactly what is the problem with popular sovereignty is when it's Kansas, it's close enough that northerners and southerners begin to flood into Kansas to claim it for the north or for the south. The idea of popular sovereignty, you know, opens up Kansas as, you know, a, a battleground to compete over that territory for either the north or the south. Um, and what's, what's kind of interesting about it is that, you know, he legislated right over the top of the Missouri Compromise. It's very symbolic. You know, the Missouri Compromise from 1820 had managed to, you know, in theory, hold the Union together for about 34 years. And Stephen A. Douglas comes in and just ignores it. In Kansas, a, a virtual civil war erupts. It's called Bleeding Kansas. And it goes from 1854 really through the Civil War in Kansas where you have people from the north coming there to settle, people from the south with slaves coming there to settle, and they're trying to claim Kansas for either the north or the south. And this is an image right here of John Brown. And John Brown is a staunch abolitionist who is sponsored by New England abolitionists to go to Kansas specifically for the purpose of defending it as a northern claim. Uh, he brings his sons out there. You know, they, they, uh, they massacre some pro-southern Kansas settlers uh, it, it gets ugly in Kansas. The, the Civil War is essentially starting right there in Kansas. And if we look at 
you know, what's happening in Kansas, uh, Pottawatomie Creek, this is where John Brown led his sons and they massacred, I think, like eight people. I'd have to look it up, but something like that. But you can see there's, you know, these, these battles led by yeah, John Brown, led by free state forces, led by slave state forces, all right around the border. But this is, you know, this is Kansas. And in after, the aftermath of Kansas also breaks out in violence on the congressional floor. I know I mentioned this in my video last week, but it's worth mentioning again. A Southerner, in, in response to Charles Sumner, who was a Northerner's speech about Kansas and how it was, you know, proof that the South was off their rocker, that they were wrong about all of this, he calls out some Southern senators and they, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, they, you know, they were wrong in his opinion. And um, this congressman from the South, Preston Brooks, comes in and he, you know, he beats Charles Sumner on the Senate floor, you know, to within an inch of his life. Another thing that you should probably have on your timeline is an important Supreme Court case, and it's called the Dred Scott case, and this happens in 1857. The question was, I'm going to go back up to a map here, you know, Dred Scott's owner, oops, sorry, Dred Scott's owner, sorry guys, lived in Missouri where slavery was obviously illegal, and he traveled with Dred Scott into the Wisconsin Territory and into Illinois, but Wisconsin Territory was free. Before it was a state, it was free. And what Dred Scott's argument was, was once he was in free territory, right, once he was in free territory, that he then should have become free. And in 1857, the, um, the Supreme Court, led by uh, Roger Tawney, who's this guy right here, Roger Tawney, they ruled that slaves were not, first, slaves were not citizens and did not have any rights to sue in the court. But since this case was in front of them, what they said was that the Congress did not have the right, and this is big, that the Congress did not have the right to tell people where they could and couldn't bring their property. And so, you know, now 37 years after the fact, the Supreme Court rules that the Missouri Compromise, again, this thing that probably held the Union together for a long chunk of time, was unconstitutional. So the, the spirit of compromise is really breaking apart. You know, the, the, the ability to compromise is proving to fail. The Missouri Compromise is being legislated over with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. It's being ruled unconstitutional historically in the Dred Scott case. We see Kansas being open to popular sovereignty and it resulting directly in violence and so the question is, what can be done to cure the union at this point? Is there anything that can be done? You guys know what John C. Calhoun thought. He thought the only thing that can be done is for the Northerners to change their ways. The Northerners had to back off of their strong stances. Well, let's look at one more thing from the 1850s before we get into the 1860s starting tomorrow. But this is, you know, and, and I'm sorry, let's look at two things. Real quick, real quick, one thing. In 1858, there was a, an important Senate election in Illinois, and um, the candidates were Stephen A. Douglas, maybe the most po popular and famous and powerful politician in the United States, was running for re-election in the Senate against a young, kind of up-and-coming politician from Springfield named Abraham Lincoln. And they had a series of debates around the state of Illinois, famously known as the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And in those Lincoln-Douglas debates, Abraham Lincoln outlines what was the basis, what was going to become the basis for this new political party, the Republican Party, of which he was quickly emerging as the leader, or at least one of the leaders. And because Stephen A. Douglas was so famous, and th this is really important, and I'll, I'll note this in, in the bubble, but because he was so famous, there was a national press following of this of these debates. People from, you know, newspapers from South Carolina, from New York, from Boston, from Atlanta, were covering this Illinois Senate election and these debates because Stephen A. Douglas was thought to be, you know, the heir apparent to the presidency. He was going to be the next president in 1860. And Lincoln has this audience. His views get published in newspapers across the country. And that makes him very famous and popular in the North. And it makes him very infamous and unpopular in the South. The last straw, so to speak, in the 1850s is John Brown's act in Harper's Ferry. You know, John Brown is, you know, the ultimate abolitionist. He believes that he is put on earth to kill pro-slavery people until there is no more slavery. He believed he was God's direct messenger. And in 1859, he had this idea that he was going to initiate a mass insurrection of slaves. And he captured 
the armory at Harper's Ferry, and nobody rallied, and he's ultimately arrested and executed. But he represents something very fearful to the Southerners. He is acting on and trying to get slaves to have an armed insurrection, to kill their slave owners in the night. And if you look at what's happening in the 1850s, this last act is going to put the paranoia of the, of the South over the top. And when I say the paranoia of the South, what I mean is they are paranoid that the Northerners are against them, that the Northerners are trying to manipulate the country so that they have all the power, that the Northerners are being acting aggressively towards their slaves and towards slavery in general. And now it looks like you know, Northerners are going to openly attack Southerners and their institution of slavery. And so what this is going to set up is it's going to set up one of the most important presidential elections in American history in 1860. The Southerners essentially are going to put it out there that if the wrong guy wins, if the wrong party wins, we believe that there is no correcting the Union, that there is no repairing the damage, and then we have a decision to make. And so the election of 1860 becomes paramount, and it becomes the ultimate act of a failure to compromise. So my suggestion is, if you haven't already, be sure that you're taking notes on those boxes that I add to the video. That's the purpose of those, is for what I'm highlighting and for what you should be getting out of the information. Um, there will be a Google Doc for this video. I would like for you to go in and fill out the, the information. It's the usual stuff, you know, just how are, how are you understanding the things, how are we doing, and then maybe just a couple questions to make sure that you're understanding specific highlighted material from this video. Thanks, guys.